Hello, this is Michelle Trinka giving you your first lecture on pediatric assessment. I'm well aware that everybody in this course has already taken an assessment course, but I'm also aware that most of everything that you learned in that assessment course was adult assessment. So I'm going to um, give you your first introduction, which I think should help you as you make it into your clinical days. So I know it's the same for kids as it is for adults as far as why we monitor patients. We want to make sure that we recognize when they're outside of normal limits for ongoing diagnosis and, of course, prognosis. The way we monitor patients is usually non-invasive, whether it's kids or adults. The difference between kids and adults is the order that we monitor things in. With adults, pretty much if their blood pressure is good, they're good. It's the first thing that goes, and it's the one main indicator that we use. In kids, it's the last thing to go, which is why it's at the bottom of this page. Kids can have um, a normal blood pressure with almost 25% of their circulating blood volume depleted, either by dehydration or bleeding. So you cannot use blood pressure as your reason for uh, monitoring a patient. I always say if you're waiting for a child's blood pressure to drop, you're going to miss the, both the cruise and the whole vacation. The number one thing that I recommend that you look at is their perfusion. Their perfusion will tell you tons. What's their cap refill extremities versus trunk peripheral? Um, I think that'll give you a good indicator. The other big things are your heart rate. The min, you know, how tachycardic are they? Kids will get tachycardic pretty quick. And their mental status, their level of consciousness. They can go unresponsive, or not even necessarily unresponsive, but irritable or lethargic pretty quickly. And the reason that we do all of this is because we need to keep kids as good as we can find them and as good as we can keep them. So we need to be aware of respiratory failure and shock are the two reasons kids die. So you are going to uh, find that most pediatric nurses are like, excuse the expression, rabid dogs when it comes to respiratory assessment on kids. When you assess kids, they have learned very quickly, especially hospitalized children or chronically ill children, that nurses or anybody who wears a scrub outfit or has a stethoscope around their neck are pretty much the enemy. They're afraid of us very quickly. They um, want to be away from us as fast as possible. So the best way to get an assessment is to get at least your initial stuff done before they even know you're looking at it. So I, I know this picture is kind of funny, but truly, this is what you need to do. A lot of hospital um, doors have blinds in them. Peek in. Take a look at the kid before they know you're looking at them. Something that I think you might find interesting is if your patient is on a monitor, go out to the desk, see what their heart rate is on the monitor, and then when you're in the room and you're going in and you're washing your hands, introducing yourself to the family, watch that heart rate. And there's a good chance that it's going to go up by 10 to 15 points just because you, quote unquote, the enemy, have walked into the room. So if you can do some of your assessment before they're aware that you're coming, it will behoove you to get some ideas. So first things first, are they awake or asleep? If they're asleep, bonus, right? You've got extra time to walk in the room and see things quietly before they um, wake up and realize you're there. Uh, do they appear comfortable? Are they guarding? Are they holding their abdomen because they're a post-op? A lot of kids are not going to want to admit to you that they're in pain because they're afraid they're going to get a shot. Um, I personally was 15 when I had surgery, and I remember laying there thinking, is it worth, is the pain bad enough for me to get another shot, or can I just suck it up and tolerate the pain? Because I was so terrified of the needles. How are they breathing? Are they tachypnic? Are they retracting? What position are they in? Are they, you know, is it an asthmatic who's already doing tripod? Are they already, you know, just looking weird the way that they're holding themselves? Are they pink? Are they blue? Worse yet, are they gray? I know you wouldn't think there'd be anything worse than blue, but there actually is, especially in the cardiac kids. I like to think about a 10-minute visual assessment on the way in the door. That's where you're doing the things I just mentioned. You know, position of comfort, color. How fast they're breathing? Are they guarding? What's the look on their face? Is it fearful? Is it okay? You know, are they calm? All of those things are going to be very helpful to you. Um, I always recommend that in small children especially, assess them in a look, listen, and feel 
order. The reason you want to do that is think about it. If you've already got a kid who might be a little nervous, and then you have to raise their arm or raise their leg to put a blood pressure cuff on, all that extra stimulation is going to alter your vital signs by a few points. So the more you can do without even touching them, the better off you'll be. You can count respirations really just by looking at their chest going up and down. Um, normally what I do is I warm up my stethoscope and I kind of sneak it on their chest after, you know, showing them what I'm doing with it. They know stethoscopes aren't bad. So usually you can sneak your stethoscope on your chest and start counting their respiratory rate and their heart rate. You must do both rates for a full minute on small children. And you're going to need to do it for a full minute because it's going to take you a while to get used to counting these very high heart rates. Remember, a child's normal sinus rhythm is anywhere up to and including 159. We don't consider a small child in sinus tech till their heart rate's above 160. So that's very different and it's very challenging. I recommend before you come to clinicals that if you have siblings, children of your own, um, you know, somebody you babysat for that, you know, is, is small, under the age of, say, five, to try and practice taking respiratory rate and heart rates on these kids because it'll make life easier when you get into the hospital. So once again, you want to do them look, listen, and feel. Respiratory status is super important. Remember, I just mentioned the rabbit dog assessment of the respiratory system. Number one reason kids die, respiratory issues respiratory arrest. So that's why your respiratory status is so important. And since children have pristine organs that function at 100%, it's going to take a bit of um, illness before they're going to do any really true um, decompensating. They will get more and more tachypnic. They will do more and more work of breathing, but they'll still maintain SATs. I've seen kids breathing a hundred times a minute, plus retracting, nasal flaring, and everything else, and their SATs are still 95. It's amazing what children can do and still maintain decent oxygenation. That's why when you look at a kid, look at their respiratory rate. Is it normal? Is it abnormal? How much extra things are they doing to help breathe? Do you see their nostrils flaring? Do you see their retracting between the ribs, under the sternum, wherever it might be? Do you hear them making funny sounds? Are they grunting that uh, uh, at the end of respirations? Are they making a striderous sound because their airway is narrowed for whatever reason? All of those things are super important. Those are warning signs. I remember I worked with a, um, a nursing student who said, you know, to, in order to be a pediatric nurse, you have to be a detective. And that's exactly right. Because if you want to be able to recognize a kid who is starting to decompensate, you have to catch the symptoms of compensation first. So you have to catch the retractions, the tachypnea, the tachycardia, the irritability, which is their altered level of consciousness, or their lethargy, because they're going to be doing all of these symptoms for a long time, because unlike adults, kids don't go downhill. Kids compensate till they fall off the cliff. And for that reason, any time you see tachypnea, you have to figure out what's going on with the kid. It might be something as simple as pain or stress or fear, but it could also be fever, the starting of um, respiratory um, decompensation. So when you have a kid who's tachypnic, try and figure out possible causes and keep working till you do. By the time they're bradypnic, um, they've already fallen off the cliff and they're on their way down. Because what will happen is they get more and more and more tachypnic until they can't compensate anymore. They start to go bradypnic and they go into apnea very quickly. So for those reasons, you need to recognize them when they're still in the tachypnic phase. Because by the time they're bradypnic, you're in deep doo-doo. Irregulatory respiratory rhythms um, are very frequently seen in children. Um, usually you'll consider it normal unless you heard something that he's never done this before. But abnormal, irregular, I should, not abnormal, irregular respiratory patterns are very, very common, especially in small kids. If I notice somebody is having an irregular rhythm, I always, just to cover it, I always make sure that I let the provider know. Remember, in infants, they're obligate nose breathers. 
they cannot breathe through their mouth at this point. So we really need to make sure their nostrils are patent. If they come in with a cold or RSV, we need to do a lot of suctioning to get their nostrils clear. Um, and it's, it's really weird because um, they don't realize that they, they'll cough something up or you'll hear a lot of gunky sounds when they breathe. And it never dawns on them that they could blow their nose or they could spit it out. They'll just sit there with it in there and until we get and pull it out. We need to make sure that the parents, and so that means you have to learn it first, how to use those blue bulb suction balls. Um, if you're not comfortable with it, that's something that we're going to be covering in our skills day. We need to make sure you know how to do it so you can teach parents. Because parents will just say, oh, yeah, I know how to do it. But if they haven't seen somebody actually demonstrate it and demonstrate it correctly, they might be shoving these the sputum, should say, <clears throat> the secretions further down the airway rather than sucking them out. Remember the last uh, bullet here? Your airways are small, right? Because your airway is the size of your pinky. So think about it. If your airway is the size of a pinky, your trachea, how small is an infant's pinky? And if they have a cold or RSV with a lot of mucus, how easy is it going to be for them to completely block off their airway passages? So the things you have to worry about is the secretions. You also have to worry if they have reactive airway disease, which is pretty much what we'll call asthma in very young children because we don't want to give them that diagnosis right away of asthma. So RAD, reactive airway disease, but they will get the edema from that, um, constriction, occluded artificial airway. Sometimes kids will have a trach, or we might put an oral airway, or what we call the nasal trumpets, right, the nasal pharyngeal airways in. Remember, we can put those in to be helpful, but they can plug off too. So just because you, you can't think of safety by having, well, they, they have a trach, so they'll be fine. Trachs can plug off, so can other things. Remember that because their ribs are still full of cartilage, they haven't hardened into bones yet. I like that word cartilaginous. So because of that, they have very thin and flexible chest walls. So that's why you can see retractions really well. You can also, unfortunately, hear referred sounds. Sometimes it'll be an upper airway noise, but when you're listening to the lungs, you'll think it's there. So that's why if you're not sure where the sound's coming from, I recommend you put the stethoscope um, on their actual neck to see if it's louder there. Um, some kids have paralyzed diaphragms either because they've had surgery or they're just born that way. So be careful watching your breathing. A paralyzed diaphragm on one side or the other can really make a big difference in these little kids. Take a look at this kid. Um, I don't know about you, but if I saw this kid and I walked in the room, if a little bit of oxygen didn't do what I thought it was going to do for this kid, I'd be pressing the code blue button. This kid's got every piece of, I'm about to stop breathing and die on you. He's got the breastbone to the backbone. You can see the intercostal re uh, retractions because you can almost put your fingers between those ribs. He's got the nasal flaring. I bet he's making some really good sounds that are bad sounds. And most importantly, he has that look of impending doom. Now, little kids aren't going to look at you and say, I think I'm going to die today. But I think if this kid was verbal, that's about the words that would be coming out of his mouth. So the things that you're looking for when you think someone's getting ready to crump, as I was saying, either increased rate and effort or they're start, they've already started to fall off the cliff and now they're decreased. Breath sounds should be loud if they start to get muffled or quieter. That's usually bad news. As I said, level of consciousness or poor response to pain, I can remember calling providers and saying, I just did a venipuncture on this kid. He didn't move. He didn't cry. That's bad, right? Because kids usually start crying the minute you walk in the room to start doing something evil. And if you manage to get through the entire procedure and they didn't even react, they are really, they're falling off the cliff at this point. Poor muscle tone. There have been times where you'll go in the room and the kid are flaccid. Another bad, bad, impending doom kind of thing. As I said, blue is bad. Um, and differentiate um, peripheral cyanosis is also bad. Heart rate. I already talked about fast and slow on the breathing. It's pretty much the same on heart rate. 
Now, if you remember back to um, A and P, you learned that cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. Well, that's for adults. When you talk small children, their myocardium is immature, which means they can't increase stroke volume. So if they need an increased cardiac output, the only way they're going to get it is if they have an increased heart rate. For that reason, tachycardia, you have to think bad until proven otherwise. So anytime I see a kid who's tachycardic, I may start by, let's check the diaper, make sure he's not hungry, make sure he has no reasons for being in discomfort. If all of those things check out, then I'm going to start looking at that kid worrying about impending shock of some size, shape, or form. The problem with little kids, well, actually all kids, is that when they get febrile, their periphery starts to clamp down and they have an altered cap refill. When they go into shock, their periphery shuts down and they get an altered cap refill. Some people will say, well, they just have all of this problem with their cap refill because they have a fever. Let's wait for the fever to go away. We'll give them some Tylenol. That period of time that you're waiting could be enough to put that kid in complete shock and get to the point where they're, again, falling off the cliff. So for that reason, you have to always act on things and work things up just to be sure that they're doing okay. You're probably getting paranoid just from the way I keep talking about falling off cliffs. But I think that's one of the reasons I went into pediatrics. I was an adult critical care nurse who would pretty much seen and done it all. And I went to peds and realized that these kids can just turn at the flip of a coin. And it's always impressive how fast a kid can grump. So we have to be on top of these kids, play pediatric detective, and monitor them for alterations in, um, in their assessment. I think I've already talked about the mental status enough. Remember, little kids can't tell you, I don't feel good. So when you're talking infants, irritability can be anything from, I have gas, I'm hungry, I have a load in my diapers, to I'm in VTAC with a pulse. So for that reason, again, irritability has to be checked out. And by the time they're lethargic, you've missed something. So you need to watch their level of consciousness. If mom tells you this kid is not normally irritable and they are today, be afraid. Figure out what's going on. Kind of mentioned it. Fast is bad. Slow is worse. Unlike adults and kids, as I'm sure you remember when you took your BLS class, once you hit that magic number, of a heart rate under 60, it's no longer we're watching them, we're looking at them, and if they look as bad as they probably do look, when you think about a small child's heart rate under 60, we call a code and start CPR. We don't wait for them to go to zero like we do with adults. So bradycardia and tachycardia both need to be looked at. Brady much more severe and usually the last thing before they code. Just like you can have an irregular respiratory pattern, you can also have an irregular pulse, and in many children, this is normal. Temperature. You don't really think about it, because in adults, what happens if we get cold? We're not happy about it. We might shiver, but we can still maintain our core body temp at a fairly decent number. Children don't have that. They don't have a lot of subcutaneous fat. So especially with children under the age of one, they can drop temps very rapidly, and if you make them have to maintain body temp some way, they are wasting calories. So we want to make sure that we keep a kid normal thermic. We want to keep them covered, but not too covered. You know how some of these parents are 55 blankets later, they're very happy. So we want to make sure that we watch their temp, and we make sure that they're normal thermic. If they've got too much on, you're going to have to try and convince the parents they don't need quite that much, but if they don't have enough on, you need to put a little more on. Now, I'm not sure about Med City and Scottish Rite, but I know at Children's, when you're documenting temps on a kid, if they're not normal, there's a line below that that asks you what kind of intervention you did to uh, address the temp being a little too high or a little too low, or very high or very low. And there's a bunch of, you know, drop downs that will let you know. If you're at Med City or Scottish Rite and you don't have that kind of ability, I would definitely put a note on that vital sign because you need to make sure that they know that you're aware the temp wasn't normal and you addressed it. And I don't mean you have to do something big, 
But if their temp is like below 36.5, I'm going to put I covered them. I'm going to put I put PJs on them. If it's above 30, like say it's above 38, I may say I removed a blanket. Now, if they're in the big the big guns, you know, they're over 38.5, which is usually when we notify the provider, then I'm going to have to put more in there than just I uncovered them. But that's, you know, another one of those magic numbers. And it's the same for adults as it is for kids. 38.5 is a magic number that we like to notify providers when the temp gets above that. So once again, hypothermia, you have to be sure that you don't let that happen. And remember, just because the room feels okay to you doesn't mean the room is warm enough for the child. So watch your, um, your temps on your infants especially. Mentioned the 38.5 already. Um, another thing I put here at the bottom of uh, bullet with febrile seizures, they're very big in kids between six months and five years. When you're talking febrile seizures, it's not how high the fever goes, it's how fast the fever goes up. Um, I still remember, um, you'll hear me talk about my grandchildren quite a bit. Um, my oldest grandchild, when he was um, about one, one and a half perhaps, he, um, they went out to lunch with him and he was, he had, he had a spike of a temp the night before. So they checked him before they went to the restaurant and his temp was normal. So they went out to eat. And somewhere around the end of the meal, before they could think about ordering dessert, he started to look pretty weird. You know, you'll, you'll start to see kids will display, you know, like their ears might get red or they get a little listless when they start to spike a temp. He went from normal thermic to 104 in less than an hour. He ended up having a febrile seizure at the restaurant. Wasn't that some excitement? 911. And by the way, the restaurant comped his food. Um, they never had to pay for it. So if you want a free meal at Saltgrass, you might want to think about bringing a febrile seizure kid in. I'm kidding, of course. Um, once kid has a febrile seizure, you want to monitor them for many years to come till they hit about that magic age of six. And after that point, it doesn't seem to be much of a problem. I've already mentioned we want to make sure when you're counting your kid's heart rate, you do it apically. You don't do radials, never, on small children. Um, you, you know, brachials are there to check if they have a pulse during code blues. But if you want to check heart rates on small children, apical is the way to go. It's not till they hit school age, like it says in this, in this uh, slide, that you can count on that radial pulse being reliable. So, Anybody under the age of five, I think at least your first vital of the day, you need to do apicals. I already mentioned at the very beginning of this how important cap refill is and pulses. Remember, you got perfect functioning organs. You're not going to find having, you're not going to have difficulty finding pulses in small children. Everybody's got two to three plus pulses. If they're not, that's usually telling you your perfusion is going down. When you check cap refill on children, you do not check nail beds. You check um, beds of the fingers or, you know, palms of the hands, the bottoms of the feet. Um, when you're checking the uh, central cap refill, anywhere on the trunk, but you're looking for immediate cap refill. If you start to have prolonged, that's your first symptoms, other than tachycardia, that you're starting to have issues with perfusion. So here's pictures about cap refill. So you can see they're checking it on the top of the foot. That's fine also. You just don't want to use nail beds. Mention about the blood pressure being the last thing, but we do take blood pressures. You want to make sure that you've got an appropriate size cuff. And you're going to, and it can be kind of dicey because the appropriate size cuff will fit one extremity well, but not another. For very small children, we frequently use the, the leg, the calf. So you might be thinking that this is a arm blood pressure cuff. When you put it on the arm, it's too big. Well, maybe they haven't been using the arm. Maybe they've been using the leg. So what I always do before I start looking to take my vitals is I open up the chart and look at the vital sign sheet. And for several reasons, but one of them is going to be to tell me where the last time they took a blood pressure on this kid. So if everybody's been taking it on the right leg, guess where I'm going to take it? Because consistency will make it easier to trend. 
The other reason I want to open up my vital signs before I even go in the room is I need to know where this kid's vital signs live. What does that mean? How many of you guys have a temperature that's normal at 98.6? I bet you're thinking right now, well, actually, I'm more like 97.5, or maybe I'm only 98.1. You know what your norm is. It might not be perfectly normal. The same thing happens with children. A normal heart rate for a small child might be 100 to 120, but this kid normally hangs out in the 130 range because he has a chronic illness. So that's why it's always important to look at your vital sign sheet and look back four or five or six vitals in a row and say, oh, well, his heart rate hangs in the 120 range. His temp hangs in the 36.5 range. His respiratory rate is normally this. So that way, when you go in the room, yes, it's nice to know the normal limits. And for exams, you'll need to know a little bit of normal limits. But for when you're actually interpreting your patient's vitals, you need to know where they live, not what normal limits are, what your patient's normal limits are. And isn't that the same with your adults? Right? Not every adult has a heart rate of 70. Some have heart rates of 90. Some have heart rates of 40. You've got to always see the trend of a child, of your patient. I already mentioned the blood pressure being the last thing we look at. Modeling is something that we will see in children. Um, usually this comes along with altered perfusion with the slower cap refill. When we see modeling, it's usually a bad sign and it's something we must report. The only two kinds of kids that we're not as impressed with if they have modeling is preemies in a NICU, so premature kids, and um, kids with Down syndrome. They frequently will have some modeling that isn't that big a deal. The most important thing a pediatric nurse must do, must, 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 must do, is listen to the parents. I can't tell you how many times people have blown off parents and the next day they come in and their kid's in the ICU or their kid had a really bad night and got unstable. If a parent tells you their kid's not acting right, believe them. They know their children. The only ones you can blow off a little bit are newborns because they don't know their kids yet. Kids a week old, two, you know, two or three days old, they really don't know that much yet. But if this is a, you know, six month old, one year old, five year old, and they say my kid ain't right, you take them at their word and you figure out what they're saying. I can't tell you how many times I've looked and done a full assessment and said your kid looks fine to me. And then they'll say something like, he never sits in bed and watches TV. The only time he sits down is when he's eating or when he falls asleep, we put him in his bed. He falls asleep somewhere playing and we have to pick him up and put him in his bed. It's not uncommon to hear stuff like that. So if a parent tells you he ain't right, please make it an important fact. Make sure you let the providers know. You know, I assessed this kid. I found nothing wrong, but the mother is concerned. She says he's not acting normal. I promise you the provider will come. I already started to tell you about the normal limits, what their norms are versus where um, the norms are for real kids. This is a little bit of a table. I wouldn't memorize anything, but if you notice, what happens in small children is very different. Your, your numbers don't really normalize out till you hit puberty. When we start thinking about what normal adult vitals are, it's somewhere around puberty, somewhere around teenagers. So until you get to that point, you really have to look at the age of the kid to figure out if the normals are, if the kid is within normal limits. I like formulas, so I threw a couple in here. These will not be on any test. This is for your own benefit, because I know there's a lot of weird people out there like me that kind of like formulas to utilize. Pain. Big, huge thing. Remember I told you the story about me as a 15-year-old not wanting to tell you about my pain. How about a month, a one month old? He can't sit there and say, my arm hurts. So we have to make sure that we evaluate pain using the correct pain scale for the age of a child. Any pain score greater than one, something needs to be intervened. Now, I'm not saying you need to give him drugs. Maybe you need to, you know, put him in a, a bouncy seat, have mom hold him, swaddle him. You need to intervene, you know, maybe give him his passy, whatever it is. But you need to do something. And then, of course, anytime you do an intervention, you must, must, must reevaluate and document that you reevaluated. So this is um, 
the different types of pain scores that are out there, what you're going to see most hospitals in this area will use, if you look down the third one, FLAC, that's what we use for nonverbal people. So any kid who doesn't talk yet is going to get FLAC. What about if I have a 17-year-old cerebral palsy kid that will never talk? FLAC. So what if I have a kid who's sedated, but normally he talks? You're not going to use FLAC. You're going to use the appropriate table and just say sedated. So we don't change our pain scales for the age of, you know, for the level of consciousness. It's whatever permanent um, scale they're on. That's what we're going to use. So flack is for the nonverbal. Faces are for verbal kids who don't know how to talk yet, but can understand looking at pictures. The visual analog scale, which we use for adults, the 1 to 5 or 1 to 10, you got to have a kid old enough to understand the concept of greater than and less than. Until they understand that concept, you can't use it. That's why on this form, it says to wait till they're at least eight. Very, a few kids are maybe a little younger, but greater than, less than is pretty much a big concept. Another big important thing is weight. You want to make sure that you've got an accurate weight because what happens with that number? A huge amount of things. First of all, all your drugs are calculated by your patient's weight. You figure out if the patient's gaining weight or not by their weight. You figure out if someone's going into congestive heart failure, fluid retention by their weight. So if you don't have accurate weights, you're going to have some problems because no one's going to know what's going on with the kid. So um, there are different ways to weigh them, but my recommendation is the same amount of clothes on or off, the same scale at the same time of day. That's your most accurate way of doing it. If the kid has a diaper, you want the kid either naked or zero the scale with a dry diaper on and make sure their diaper is clean and dry before you uh, weigh them. I kind of mentioned the trending thing. Weights are the same way. We are going to trend our weights. Are they slowly going up? Are they going down? What is that telling us? You know, if my I and O says I'm 300 ad, and lo and behold, look, they gained 0.3 kilos today. That goes together. And something we have to always do, the reason we have to get good weights, is because I and O's outside of an ICU setting or a kid with a Foley are kind of catch as catch can. Parents sometimes don't remember to save a diaper. So, or sometimes they'll weigh a diaper for us and then throw it away. And what we don't know is all the wipes were in the diaper. So it wasn't an accurate weight. So because of that, we have to have those accurate weights to go with the INOs to make sure we know that we're gaining weight, not putting on water weight, things along that line. FOCs are things that we do on children. Every hospital has different um, frequencies. So you might want to find out on your unit what the norm is. Um, it's almost always done on children under three on admission. Especially now with all the Zika stuff, you're hearing all about microcephaly. So we want to make sure that the, he the head is where it belongs, right? They might have hydrocephaly. So for those reasons, we have to make sure that we're looking at the F FOC and document it as needed. Fontanelles are a wonderful thing on children that still have them. The anterior fontanelle, can, it's almost like a dipstick on the car, lets you know if you're a poor high or court low. If I have a kid who is fluid depleted because of nausea and vomiting and diarrhea, you bet that fontanelle is going to be sunken. If I have a kid who comes in as a head trauma and that fontanelle not only is it is it high but it's firm, that's telling me there's something bad going on in that brain. We need to go and take him in to take a look at that. Um, something that I thought was pretty cool is that they can actually do a head sono through the fontanelle. Who knew? INOs, we need to make sure, just like everything else, kids can get dehydrated very, very quickly. They don't have a lot of extra fluid stores like we do. So anytime a kid starts to have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you have to be very aware, and these kids are going to show up very quickly. I still remember the first child that I admitted into the PICU who came in with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and this kid came in on death's door. His cap refill was like seven or eight seconds. 
His blood pressure was like 40 over 20. Heart rate was 200. I mean, the kid looked like death. We had a heck of a time resuscitating this kid. And I remember as we're working really hard, thinking what kind of loser parents would leave this kid home so long. And I remember when the mom came in, I asked her how long the baby was sick before she brought the baby in. And her reply was eight hours. The kid couldn't keep anything down for eight hours, and that's how fast this kid got sick. It's amazing. So for that reason, we've got to keep our I and O's um, very well monitored. We have to make sure that if we start going into the negative, that we let people know. You can't wait till the end of a 12-hour shift to determine that your kid is very negative, is losing more out than is taking in, because that can be too late. So you want to make sure that every four hours you're looking at your I and O's to make sure that they're semi-balanced. If they're a little ahead or a lot ahead, you might even have to call to see if anybody wants to get some diuretics for this kid. I'm giving you your IV uh, maintenance calculations, both the 24-hour type and the hourly type. These are things that you need to keep in mind. You want to make sure that they're getting the correct amount of fluid order. Some of you guys are going to be in teaching hospitals where you're counting on residents who maybe have only been doctors since July 1st. Um, you need to make sure that you recalculate their IV rates to make sure they're where they're supposed to be. Especially if you guys happen to have renal or cardiac kids, they will never be on full maintenance Those, because you're going to fluid overload them licky split. So you need to make sure they're on the right amounts that they're supposed to be on. Um, something to keep in mind with little kids, unlike the little old ladies, right? Nurse, my bowel movement is two hours late. I need prune juice. Kids don't do that. They don't care about BMs. Neither do ICU nurses, I'll just tell you, because I've been one for many, many years. So you need to make sure you find out how often this kid normally has BMs and make sure that they're having them. Because we give these kids narcotics because they've had surgery or we are doing heavy sedation on them. We may end up with a, a kid who's constipated and you you may not figure it out for days. And by then we have bigger problems. The different um, psychosocial developments. I know one of the things that I will always ask my students is I want one family psychosocial problem on every one of my patients, every one of their patients. In the land of peds, family um, functioning is huge. You know, it's sad when you hear about people who have no family as adults, right? You find out that they're single and they've never been married and so they have no children and their siblings are gone and they're pretty alone in the world. Yes, that's sad and tragic. But imagine if you've got a kid that's running into family dynamic issues. So here's this chronically ill kid who has been in the hospital for six months. And yes, these things happen. Who've never been home. And these poor parents are still trying to uh, make ends meet, right? You know, we have these bad habits. We like to eat and live indoors. So you've got parents who have to leave their small children in the hospital alone because they have to go back to work. So when the child finally does come home, they can stay home with them. How many times you know families that they count on both salaries in order to make ends meet? And now they have a child with special needs that they had never expected to have. They, nobody plans for special needs kids. And the kid is born and they find out that they have special needs. Daycares don't take special needs kids. So now their entire life has turned upside down and inside out. You might have older siblings that are now starting to act out because they're not getting attention like they used to. Um, who's watching the extra kids? So you've got so many family psychosocial things going on that we've got to always keep those things in mind when we're working with these kids. Another part is if this is a chronic illness, is there a blame game going on? Mom's saying it's, it's your family's genes and dad's saying you did something when you were pregnant and you never know, you know, those kind of psychosocial things. So there's a lot more of that involved in peds, I think, than I ever played with in the land of adults. The rest of the slides that are on here are more for, as you start to take care of kids, things to keep in mind. The only thing that you're going to do for newborn kind of kids where you're talking, if you need to know that the med went in and they got the whole dose, IV push is about it. Because their GI tract is immature and they don't absorb things. They're, um, they have very little sub-Q. Most of their muscles aren't developed, so giving IMs is kind of questionable. So it's... It's something to keep in mind, which is why some of the meds that we give on a regular basis 
doses have to be higher in kids. Not only is absorption a problem, but so is their metabolism, which is a lot higher. So these slides kind of go along with that, um, and I'm not going to go into it, but I wanted to give you the info. Rules of medication administration. It can be very challenging to give kid, uh, medications to little kids. Remember, never ever give a kid a choice of saying no. You never go in the room and say, can I give you your medicine now? Because if the kid is smart, they're going to look at you and say no. So you might want to ask them things like, would you like your medicine with juice or with water? Um, you know, ask mom, how do they normally take it? Many times the parents will say, I'll give it to them. And never, ever lie to a kid. Because if you lie to them, not only is it going to hurt your relationship, every nurse that comes after you is going to have the same issue. If it's going to hurt, you tell them it's going to hurt. But you can tell them it's only going to hurt for a minute. And then it'll be over. And it'll be done. Or if it doesn't taste good, let them know. You know, if they say, is it icky? little bit, but we can put some of this in it to make it taste better. Or I can give you some juice right away as soon as you're done. But we've got to take this very important medicine. If the kid won't take it, call Child Life. Child Life has more tricks up their trade. You know, more things that they can think of that you and I would never even come up with. So if I have difficulty getting a kid to do a treatment or take a med, I'll call Child Life either to see if they can come or to give me advice. Um, a few other things, never talk in front of a kid as if they weren't there. Unless it's an infant under the age of, say, six months, I make sure that I, in, in, you know, involve the kid a little bit. Six months, not so much. But once they hit a year, I try and talk to the kid and make sure the parents are listening. Um, especially once they hit toddler, three-year-olds, you've got to talk to the kid and hope the, and watch, make sure the parents are listening too. But if you talk above the kid, the kid's going to not understand everything you say because you're talking grown-up speak, and the kid's going to get scared. So I strongly recommend talk to the kid. I've also got things in here for age-based considerations for giving meds and for a little bit of development stuff. Um, again, I'm not going to read through this. This is here for your information. And that concludes my talk today. We're going to be doing a lot more with you with pediatric assessment over the next few um, weeks to make sure that by the time you start to